Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Fury. Thank you, Mo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm just going to use this mic. I found it a little easier than standing back there. I've got a bunch of slides I'm going to walk through. Uh, I've got some information that I think you've heard bits and pieces of already, so I'm going to try and speed through there, but through those. But uh, I think all the information we've heard so far is, is coming together nicely in terms of what I have to present. So the view from here, tried to choose a nice picture with a view. Uh, just a little bit of background on the municipality. I know there's lots of, lots of folks from the community here but I thought there might be some people from out of town. We were incorporated in, in uh, 1975 as a purpose-built resort municipality. Uh, there's about 12,000 residents, and as you've probably heard earlier, I think, we get three million annual visitors. That's up from about uh, three or four years ago from 2.5 million visitors. So a lot more, I'll talk more about that growth we've heard about already. Mountains, trails, and village, and really the people are the engine of the community. Uh, the municipality is sort of a primary in, uh, responsibility in off-mountain. Obviously, we work very closely with our mountain partners with uh, Vail. And we're also recognized as an uh, innovator in many areas, particularly the Whistler Housing Authority, which some of you may know is actually uh, part of the curriculum in the Urban Planning School at Western University. So working together, just wanted a quick slide. Really, part our, our success is around our partnerships uh, both in the resort and, and outside in our, <coughs> excuse me, in the quarter. Lillooet and Squamish, uh, Chief Dean is here following me today. That picture down in the corner, uh, in the corner was, I think, last spring, Chief, where we signed a member of uh, understanding between the, uh, uh, the municipality, the province, uh, Vail, or then Whistler Blackcomb, and uh, uh, the Lillooet and Squamish nations. We also have a lot of uh, community engagements, community forums. Some of you have probably been at our housing forum or our uh, transit forum that we had a little while ago. Uh, we try to reach out a lot. And we have a very good relationship, as uh, MLA Sturdy mentioned, with the, part, with the province in particular, who provides us about $10 million in uh, funding that we put into the tourism sector. And uh, I'll show in a moment while that's... Uh, uh, a very uh, good figure. So we have a uh, approved Whistler bed base, includes quite a large supply and range of accommodations. We have about 9,000 tourist accommodation uh, units. That's made up of about 25,000 uh, accommodation bed units. There's a diversity of offerings, hotels, B&Bs. Uh, we even have campgrounds here that you're, many are aware, lodge. But we also have uh, chalets, townhomes that are on the rental market. And I'll talk in a moment about the Airbnb and illegal rent rentals and how that has sort of uh, come into the community and how we're responding. So, and not to forget, and I'll talk more about this, we have in our resident restricted housing about uh, 6,400 employee beds. So let's talk about the tourism economy that folks have already spoken about earlier. I'll go into a little bit of detail. Uh, Jordan was mentioning some of the figures here. Uh, one that he, he referenced, if you go across the top and down, uh, third, from the, third from the left on the bottom, 23% of our share of tourism export revenue. That's in the $800 million range. So if you think about it, it's sort of like on the forestry side, raw logs. This is new money coming into the province that we didn't have to pay anything in terms of generating it. So it's, it's very good value for, for BC. We generate about 500, down the bottom left, uh, 500 million in annual tax revenue. Uh, that's to all three levels of government, and we uh, generate about 142 million, excuse me, to the provincial government. So Jordan was mentioning the resort municipality initiative uh, fund, which is about seven million a year. And we met with, met with some ministers a little while ago, ago about trying to continue that. And uh, we pointed out to them that we actually pay that seven million back by about the 11th of January each year through our taxes. So, and we have about 15,000 employees in the community of uh, 12,000. 
So in terms of micro and uh, macro and micro environmental factors affecting tourism, obviously the uh, US dollar uh, that's been talked about as a big factor is actually the biggest uh, statistical factor that influences the uh, growth of uh, occupancy here in the community. Low interest rates and inflation. Uh, we have a lot of new flights coming into YVR, which is bringing in folks from Asia that are finding their way up to the community. Climate change and weather uncertainty. I'll talk about that in a moment as well. Strong provincial economy that Helmut spoke of, real estate and, and foreign investment that Pat spoke of. Uh, Vale uh, purchase, excuse me, is, a, uh, is also a big factor, and I'm sure Pete's going to talk about that in a sec. And infrastructure and program investment and the sharing economy, which is another way to say Airbnb and others. So in terms of our, our evolving reality, certainly we live in a, a cyclical economy here. If you look on the left-hand side, between 2010 and 2013, we had low uh, uh, occupancy rates in the hotels, decrease in visitation down to 2.3 million, uh, decline in residential uh, tourism accommodation uh, values that Pat spoke about some of that. And we also had higher commercial vacancy rates in the stroll and a number of other factors. Jump forward three or four years, we have uh, super high hotel occupancy rates. I think we've gone from about 54% uh, annual occupancy to around 64, 65% in the last three or five years. Uh, summer and winter vis uh, visitation has grown. We're actually over 3 million this past year is about 3.3. And that's created a lot of pressure on commercial lease, high number of employees, uh, decline in the workforce living locally, even though we're still over our 76% target, and uh, a growing population. So I wanted to share and just to give a bit of a measure of the growth in the uh, year-round uh, uh, summer occupancy and winter. So just a quick, a, I know there's a lot on this slide, but the left-hand side of each month is 2010, and the right-hand side is 2017 with the various years in between. So if you look at a place like May, or a month like May, you can see huge growth there between 2010 and 2017, like up in the range of almost 40%, or, or actually June is more like 40%. July and August, really hitting the, uh, the tops of uh, January, February, and March, you can almost fold those over on one another. Lots of folks here will remember uh, you know, being a single season resort, and uh, what was then known as the shoulder seasons, you look in May and June and October, there's been a huge growth. That's been our focus for the last while, working with our partners, Torres and Whistler and others, is to try and ease off on the attraction, attracting of people in those peak January, February, August, uh, July, August uh, months. And if we want to grow any, let's grow the, the shoulder seasons. Uh, looking at our growing population, we went, as I mentioned earlier, went from around uh, 9,000 in 2016 to 2016 up to about 12,000. And Pat was mentioning about the change in uh, sort of who's coming here. If you look at the uh, 20 to 20, th sorry, the uh, 30 to 39 group, just around the bottom of that chart on the right, you can see a real increase. But what's interesting is the 20 to 24 group has just flattened off. We haven't had any group, uh, sorry, any growth in that, uh, that age group for a while. And then on the far right, uh, we have that 65 plus has really shot up. And uh, Pat, again, spoke to some of that. Uh, people who are cashing out and coming up here, why wouldn't they want to live here? I call them amenity, amenity migrants. I don't know if that's a nice ter term or not. But people who want to go, this is a beautiful place to live, and that's, that's impacting us. So some interesting changes in, uh, in the demographics. So in terms of the implications of the success that I just ran through, there's lots of areas where that has impacted the community. I thought I'd focus on three, housing and affordability and supply, traffic congestion and parking, and the ever-evolving resort characteristics. So jumping into transportation and climate action as part of that, uh, we have worked over the last a couple of years, we have a transportation advisory group made up of members of the community, members of council, and other folks. 
to try and find ways to uh, deal with the transportation challenges we have. We did a lot of research and actually found some interesting outcomes, particularly on, for the weekends on a Saturday and uh, Sunday mornings, about 61% of the traffic between Function and uh, Village Gate is generated locally. I distinguish between generated locally and locals. It doesn't necessarily mean they're locals, but there are people here who sort of a churn of moving around. So that goes to you know, what change we want to make. Uh, Jordan spoke about uh, putting in a third lane from Function to uh, Village Gate. We have a study underway, or actually the Ministry of Transportation does, to look at that and how it would, it would require some uh, sorry, road widening in certain areas. That could be a, a combination with a, a, a cheater bus lane. A cheater bus lane is where buses pull out and, and get around the, uh, the other buses, so, or get around the traffic. We're also uh, working closely and uh, working with uh, Lillawatt and the uh, Squamish Nation and the District of Squamish and Pemberton on a, a B, extending BC Transit into a regional transit model. So going right from uh, Mount Curry right to Vancouver uh, in a, with a transit system. And we're hopeful to have that up and going in the next couple of years. There's some funding challenges, obviously, with that and some governance things we need to work through. But uh, after talking to uh, ministry uh, staff and certainly when, uh, when the Liberal government was in and, and I think the new government, there isn't a lot of money for a new infrastructure, like you know, big road jobs, and they're, they're not coming up with another six or seven hundred million dollars for the highway, but I think there is money for transit along the highway. So what we're trying to achieve is increased availability of parking, uh, flexibility in travel options, reduced congestion, and all of that contributing to uh, climate change and more success in business. Uh, on the climate change side, we did have a committee get together and we got some uh, folks from the University of Victoria who were client, cl uh, climate scientists who took a uh, climate, uh, sort of a, a model that they use in predicting how the climate is going to change over time with global warming. And they looked at from 1970s to about uh, out to the uh, 2050 or 2070. And this is what they came back with, is over the next 50 years or so, we're going to have an increase in the intensity and frequency of heavy rains, longer, hotter, drier summers, milder winters uh, with increasing precipitation uh, falling as rain near the valley bottom. But interestingly, the snowpack at a higher level will be seen, uh, will see limited change, which is encouraging. I had heard uh, that Aspen did a similar exercise, and by 20. 75, they expected to have no skiing in Aspen with their predicted uh, climate change. So if you look at that and our climate action uh, model, and I'm just conscious of the time, I won't go into all the details, one of the biggest threats we face in this community is wildfire and interface wildfire in particular. And the municipality is putting about a, a million dollars a year into that to really mitigate the chance of wildfire uh, and looking at things like, if you get down a picture down in the Callahan, putting a, f a fuel break in there so the wild, if the wildfire doesn't happen, it, it stops rather than keep coming up the valley. Similarly, uh, on, over on the uh, Chequemus side. And while there's been you know, really great uh, accolades and great success in responding to wildfires in you know, places like Fort McMurray and in the interior, what the criticism they're coming out now is that communities need to be more prepared and to take action in, event, in advance to mitigate the chance of wildfire. You can't eliminate it, but we can take uh, efforts to try and uh, reduce the uh, occurrence. So on housing, which I think we're all interested in here, we have uh, hit our 76% uh, target, uh, or 75, we've stayed over that. There has been the growth in, it's interesting to go back and look at 2006, 7, and up to uh, 15, 16, we're really back to where we were uh, in terms of population. I pulled this, we pull this chart together to look at rental rates. These are market rates, just to get at the affordability. I know there's a lot of information here, but if you look down in the lower left-hand side, you have the green, uh, sort of like the, the po not a positive, but the, it's expected or, or uh, uh, seen as a good 
relationship between your income and how much you pay for housing is around a 30% range. So if you look at the incomes on the, on the left-hand side, 70,000, 110, 130, and look at the rates of one and two bedrooms, these are markets, uh, you've got to be earning a fairly hefty income to get over to a three bedroom uh, on the other side. So uh, as I mentioned, our, uh, we've had a lot of growth and we had, a, a, you know, the growth in business has also generated a, a lot of seasonal workers. So we have, the seasonal workers have gone up uh, from about 2012, 13, 4,600 to 6,400. Uh, in 1617, and I think that's no longer projected as actually uh, that was the result. And what that has done is they, they're, you know, pile, piling six, seven, eight, nine, ten into, uh, you know, the neighborhoods that were previously family rentals and driving, if you get, you know, eight or nine people in a house, they're more able to pay for a really high rental rate than a family is. So we need to look at how we respond to that as well. So. How do we address that? How do we move forward? Uh, we're taking a multi-pronged approach to alleviating uh, housing pressures. We had, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard, the Mayor's Housing Task Force met for probably about the last year, had a, a number of big community forums. We had 2,200 people respond to a uh, housing survey, which was one of the biggest responses. And I'll just walk through quickly some of the responses. Uh, so in terms of uh, Airbnb, uh, just to pick on one of those online uh, rentals, uh, rental agencies, there has been a real impact in the communities, uh, sorry, in the neighborhoods. Uh, we don't actually mind Airbnb coming to our community, particularly we, when I've, I've met with them a number of times and said, hey, we've got 8,000 uh, units, mostly in the village. If you want to market them through Airbnb, great. We don't want you going into the neighborhoods where they are zoned for nightly rental and taking away, or sorry, let me back up there for a moment, zoned for residential rental, uh, residential use, and uh, turning them into uh, nightly rental. And that's, and obviously there's a, a real attraction for folks wanting to make money. Uh, a a one-night rental is a lot better, a lot, generates a lot more revenue than a, a long-term rental. So what we've done is uh, we've required every accommodation provider in the community to have a business license. We've only issued business license for uh, areas that are zoned that the village, uh, Nick North, and other places of that nature. We, we don't issue them for uh, Alpine or other neighborhoods. Uh, if you are, you're prohibited from marketing, if you don't have a business license, and if we find someone who's marketing uh, and without a business license or renting without a business license, we're charging them up to a thousand dollar fine a day. And this last point here uh, looks a bit sort of bureaucratic, but we are shifting from a, a uh, going issuing tickets that are, are held in the uh, provincial or, or addressed through the provincial courts, which is very time consuming, to an adjudication system that we can do right here in town through a, a adjudicators that come from a board. Mo, how's my time looking? Okay, so uh, Whistler Housing Authority remains the focus uh, and the core of how we're going to respond to the housing challenges. Many of you are aware of this. Uh, Marla Zutt and her team just opened uh, 1310 Cloudburst, is right down in, in Chequemus at the end of the road, 27 new rentals. That's fully occupied. People moved in December. Uh, Legacy Way. There's, uh, that's going to be under construction and ready for winter 2018. Uh, I think that should be winter. Yeah, winter. Uh, they're moving forward on that one. I think that, that date is off a little bit. <laughs> and then uh, we're also, we have another uh, seniors project up in Rainbow on Bear Paw Trail, another 20 more units that are going to come on. Uh, I think that should say winter 19. It's a little ambitious that it'll be in the next month or so, given that they haven't broken ground yet. Uh, and then right where you see uh, 1310 Cloudburst, uh, WHA has another parcel right adjacent to that, and the uh, planning is underway for that and hoping to go 2019-2020. So lots of uh, work underway with WHA. Uh, Checklist Crossing Expansion. So if you look at this map here, 
Uh, the, you can see the existing Chequemus community right there in the center where those homes are. There's a, a piece up above called the Chequemus Phase Two, And then there's a large parcel down below of uh, lower Chequemus lands that the municipality has. We're moving uh, this year, uh, this past year, we've been doing a lot of site analysis, looking at uh, how that, what would be the, uh, the mix down there and, and uh, looking at what areas could be best for what type of housing in that, in, the, in particular uh, sections down in the bottom. While that's a very big chunk of land, there are actually a lot of uh, areas that are not suitable uh, riparian areas, et cetera, for development, but we can still get quite a lot of uh, opportunity down there. So it's looking at complementing the existing neighborhood, uh, tie in with uh, different rec uh, regional recreation opportunities, valley trails, green space, et cetera. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment on where we are in Chequemus. We'll also, as part of the Mayor's ta Housing Task Force, we're looking at infill opportunities. So what infill opportunities is looking for folks, rather than selling out and you know, moving to uh, another part of, of the province, is offering the opportunity to expand the infill opportunity that had been in place for just a very small section of Alpine a number of years ago, and opening it up to right across Whistler, and trying to uh, find a way that is financially attractive for homeowners if they want to uh, subdivide their home and, or subdivide their lot and stratify it so that they can take some wealth out of their, uh, their existing lot but remain in place and age in place uh, and not have to move away and creating another opportunity from one particular lot. So uh, this could be a duplex, uh, lot splits, et cetera. So the timeline for the new, uh, and I'll just walk through this quickly, I talked about uh, Cloudburst 1310, that's the WHA one. Underway, they've taken uh, occupancy in 2017. Uh, WHA, uh, the Legacy Way and Beer Paw that I, I, I mentioned a moment ago. So, yeah, there we are at the 2019 for occupancy, but the planning and architectural and design development permit is, has been worked through, and now they're going through the financing, public hearing, et cetera. Uh, 1310 Cloudburst, again, that's the one adjacent to uh, the 1310 uh, Cloudburst 1. They're sort of like 1A, 1B, we call them. Uh, that's going to be the plan and design work in 18, and then permits and construction in 19, looking at occupancy around uh, 2020. And then Chequemus Crossing expansion. So we're, uh, d as I said, we're doing a master plan site analysis that a lot of that work has been completed in 2017. Uh, 2018, looking at uh, detailed site concepts, uh, servicing, uh, determining what, what sort of servicing is needed for what areas down in the lower Chequemus in particular. Uh, 2019, infrastructure and, and construction, uh, building design, so getting the service down there. And then uh, building starting in 2020, uh, 2020, 2021, uh, and moving to occupancy around that timeline. The number of units there, TBD, there's a lot of opportunity in uh, the lower uh, section of Chequemus. So, and, and I should mention as well that for the they, those would be WHA uh, housing, but it will be a mix of both rental and uh, WHA uh, ownership. And I probably should have mentioned earlier that all of those WHA uh, in the first three lines are rental. Uh, so adding more rental uh, product. So, and then the infill policy will continue. So uh, next steps on Chequemus Crossing, uh, sort of went through all that already, but you know, the site work, concepts at 18, project management, and then occupancy up in around 2020 if possible, or 2021. So OCP and community planning, how are we moving forward? Uh, it's got a few minutes. I'll want to leave some time for some questions. So lots of you were here when we uh, worked on the, uh, the OCP. I think there was like 1,300 hours of community engagement where people uh, talked about concern over for further growth, a desire to look for uh, uh, new opportunities, uh, protect the natural environment, and to be, to be forward looking. So this was back a number of years ago. What we're doing now, and we're actually scheduling a uh, 
open house in February, uh, or sometime in February we're hoping, where we're going to sort of revisit and update and build upon the vi vision and policies of the uh, Whistler 2020 and the 2013 OCP. There's so much work there, we don't have to go back and start from scratch. We can, we can build on that. We need to update the vision and the narrative, uh, easy to grasp story, who we are, uh, what we value, and incorporate the extensive work done. And we're also going to be working with Chief Dean and with the Squamish to bring the uh, First Nations, uh, improve our relationship with the nations and bring them more into our community. So uh, the goal for 2018 on the OCP is to uh, ensure our vision and uh, official community plan still hold true of who we are as a community, that mountain culture. Uh, engage the community uh, at large, and engage our First Nation neighbors, and what do we need to do to continue to be successful. Uh, from here onward, uh, trying to answer uh, Pat's question, we want to remain true to our mountain culture and identity. There's lots of resorts out there. People come here, or visitors come here for the culture and who we are, rather than just the mountains. We want to manage the impacts of our success. We continue to uh, enhance the resilience. One thing I keep repeating is this is a cyclical economic uh, town. We gotta be prepared for eventual downturn. It's likely to come uh, sometime, although Helmut's uh, predictions were very encouraging, but you never know, there's some wild cards uh, south of the border of us. So uh, we gotta respond to the uh, global engine. And down at the bottom of Summer Council's 2018 priorities, continue to prioritize our uh, core uh, municipal services, uh, action events, housing, transportation I've talked about, facilitate improved community environmental performance, expand wildfire, as I talked about as well, and uh, environmental performance, and integrate, engage, and refresh our official community plan. And I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we, I couldn't tell you a number, but you know, we're, we're, we're getting like everyone will have an accommodation business license, uh, all the major hotels, and just on that one, for example, we're not want, like the Fairmont has 500 rooms, they don't need 500 business license, so they would have one license. Uh, I don't have a number off the top, but we, it has been a really good take up. And we have moved forward and find some folks. We have uh, taken people, uh, through the provincial court process, which is very timely, uh, very costly, and, and takes a lot of time, like up to 10,000, 15,000 legal fees. That's why we want to move to the adjudication. I think there are some other questions. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, okay, let me try and answer all that. So the. Uh, there's about 61,250 bed units uh, that have been uh, in the, in the, the not literally in the OC, OCP, but the updates that have come since 1993. I think about 53,000 or 500, or 53,500 or 54,000 have been developed. Uh, check this, I don't have a particular number, uh, but there is a lot of development opportunity down there in terms of uh, bed units. Uh, like above 1,000, 15 uh, range. Meaning in addition to what's left? Uh, that would, there's an overall amount and that would be in there. So we have, and uh, you know, people talk, uh, the community has made some uh, decisions on how big they want to be and how much growth they want. There is in the updated OCP uh, a provision to add more development that relates to an and, the, and the key words in the OCP is, does it provide extraordinary benefit to the community? Uh, but that's where we are now, and yes, sir. Mike, I'm just wondering where our boundaries are. Um, is Wedgwood's within our boundaries? It is not, no. Okay. Yeah. Is it, there, I see some development possibilities further north, and yeah. certainly in the Callahan area at the base of the road. Yeah. Do you think there'll be communities there in the foreseeable? Well, I know the Wedgwood is, uh, as Pat mentioned, is there are lots are flying off the shelf out there, and uh, but you know our our intention is to uh, contain growth, 
and to uh, you know, reduce the footprint to uh, you know, sort of the community that we have now as much as possible. Oh, again. Uh, the SLRD has a, uh, something called a regional growth strategy, which is sort of like their official community plan. Uh, they certainly have in that uh, trying to uh, avoid sprawl. They have provisions in there to uh, you know, build on existing footprints or existing communities and not have satellite communities uh, uh, pop up, obviously for environmental reasons. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Yeah. Fire boundaries, well as yeah. Fire boundaries, who is, is going to have to create their own fire department, and, and how does that play into the whole region? Because it's, you know, you have no, as a municipality, it's just not it's right outside of the boundary. Right. You have limited control as to the development plan. Yeah, well, we, we do have uh, Councillor Jack Crompton, is actually uh, from Whistler, is the chair of the SLRD board, and we do have membership on it, so we do have say there. Uh, but, you know, the SLRD goes from I don't know, down, doesn't go all the way, you know, down past Britannia, up the Squamish River Valley, Valley right up to Lillooet. So it's quite an area. So, you know, they, I don't think it would be fair to say they have the same sort of bed cap concept there, but they're not trying to pursue sprawl either. And, uh, you know, if they're looking for development in, uh, in Wedge, they don't have a, well, I shouldn't say they don't have a fire service. Their fire service is provided through whatever else fire services in the SLRD. Uh, and if they wanted to, uh, you know, if they wanted to, I sure, I assume that would impact their insurance rates. All okay. right, thank you very much, Mike, stand by. Okay.